Namaste and greetings. I, Ishika Chaudhary, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Delhi, extend my warm welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered for a special talk on the topic, social dimensions of resilience, challenges of inner city redevelopment, impact, and the way forward by Professor Sovnik Roy, as a part of the series, The State of Cities, hashtag city conversations organized by IMPRI, Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. The chair for this session is Dr. Rumi Ajaz, Senior Fellow and Head, Urban Policy Research Initiative, Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. Then with the permission of our chair, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Certainly, please introduce. Thank you, sir. Our speaker for today's episode of our hashtag City Conversations is Professor Sovnik Roy. He is professor at Department of Architecture, Town and Regional Planning, founder director at School of Ecology, Infrastructure and Human Settlement Management, Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology at Shibpur, West Bengal. His areas of interest include urban planning, urban policy for inclusive cities and housing strategies for urban poor. Professor Roy is the recipient of prestigious Ford Asia Fellowship, Shastra Indo-Canadian Fellowship and Netherlands Fellowship to conduct research on social housing and urban development in Southeast Asia, Canada and Netherlands. He's a visiting fellow in the University of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, University of California at Berkeley, USA, and Asian Institute of Technology, AIT, at Bangkok, Thailand. Professor Roy has published extensively in several journals of international and national repute on smart cities, urban policies, housing, and urban resilience. As discussants, we have Professor Shipra Mitra. She is professor at Institute for Human Development, New Delhi. Dr. Ashima Sooth, Associate Professor, Anand National University, Ahmedabad. Professor Tathagata Chatterjee, Professor of Urban Management and Governance at School of Human Settlements and Coordinator at Center for Humanities and Compassion Studies, XIM University, Bhubaneswar. Tikender Singh Panwar, former Deputy Mayor in Shimla, Visiting Senior Fellow at INPRI, New Delhi. Now I invite our Chair for, her introdu for his introductory remarks and invite the speaker. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as we learned about this uh, topic of uh, today's talk, it's about challenges uh, involved in undertaking the work related to inner city redevelopment. And uh, I think uh, this is, a very important topic to, to discuss in current times. Uh, there are a number of uh, programs of the uh, government of India that are aimed at uh, improving the quality of life and improving the conditions in India's cities. Uh, but uh, we all know that uh, a number of challenges are also being experienced. So when one thinks about this topic of inner city, redevelopment uh, and when one visits or several of India's cities, uh, they, they represent unique characteristics and that is what distinguishes Indian cities with uh, other cities across the world. Uh, the inner city characteristics are quite unique in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the social and cultural characteristics of the people who are living in those parts of the city uh, and the traditions that they follow. And uh, over time, uh, it is observed that deterioration uh, has been observed uh, while local governments are responsible for looking after these uh, areas or these parts of the city, but uh, the complexities or the social complexities are such uh, that uh, 
one or the problem has been experienced. So uh, I would uh, like to invite uh, the distinguished speaker for today, Professor Roy, uh, to learn from him what about his work on uh, inner city redevelopment, uh, the challenges involved in doing this work and the way forward. Uh, this is particularly important uh, as uh, uh, the government of India and the various urban missions that are being launched and implemented in the country and answers and solutions are, are, being, uh, are being found as to how one can address uh, this issue of improving the conditions in inner city areas. So let us learn from Professor Roy, and then uh, we will open it up, up uh, for discussion and learn about the comments from uh, the uh, distinguished panelists for today uh, as to what are the important lessons uh, that can be gained through, the, uh, through this exercise. Over to you, Professor Roy. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rumi. And uh, thanks to Impri for giving uh, me the opportunity to share my uh, opinion and thoughts about this very important topic of uh, social resilience and in inner city redevelopment, uh, the challenges and the way forward. And uh, what I uh, requested uh, Dr. Kumar also uh, that uh, I'll be speaking uh, mostly the, the, we have a very eminent uh, panel of speakers also. So probably uh, are the, the, the issues which I'm talking, probably that will resonate with many of their ideas also. So I would also uh, welcome their thoughts and, and how they look at this whole issue of unfolding of uh, this, this uh, uh, issue of social resilience, particularly in the context of the recent uh, uh, situation of COVID and even the pre-COVID situation, the vulnerability which was existing for the, the, the majority of the urban dwellers. So uh, before taking any time, I'm just uh, sharing my screen. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, uh, Inner city redevelopment is actually uh, one of the very important element of uh, uh, the other two aspects of city, redevel city development, that is uh, the uh, expansion of uh, cities uh, and also the new town. So probably these three are the kind of elements by which uh, both uh, cities in global north at one point of time in the uh, after the industrial revolution or even uh, at the beginning of at the, during the 20th century and in the global south uh, after 1950s the, when the most of these uh, global south countries became independent and uh, the industrialization in this part of the globe uh, taking uh, momentum and more than industrialization the service development of service sector so this inner city redevelopment has uh, gathered a momentum so if we go back just uh, uh, very quickly into the history, the first, uh, in fact, the inner city redevelopment was termed as uh, uh, urban regeneration uh, as a response to uh, industrial squalor in cities. And the first, uh, you all, all, all of you know that uh, the first uh, uh, city rejuvenation, large scale city reju rejuvenation happened in Paris, the renovation of Paris with uh, uh, very large public works uh, program with uh, housing for the working class, the large uh, um, avenues for the cars, movement of growth of cars, uh, attending the growth of cars, the uh, sanitation, uh, so that the public health is taken care of. So that was the first uh, major rejuvenation, uh, urban rejuvenation or urban regeneration happened. Uh, but later on, uh, this is, uh, this gathered the momentum uh, in the international context with the post-war reconstruction in Europe, particularly in Europe, uh, when the large devastation happened in the uh, medieval towns and the industrial towns at that uh, period, mainly in uh, the, uh, the European, many European countries like Poland, uh, Germany, Netherlands, in large scale. So their focus uh, or the, the main uh, thrust of the 
uh, urban regeneration or uh, reconstruction was modernization of urban centers and uh, renewal of the marginalized and poor urban areas. So there was a more of a focus, uh, not exactly physical, physical was important, but more important was the social and economic benefits to the larger sections of the society. So this uh, a very simple diagram, this explains that how the industrial revolution, which led to degraded environment in cities in, the, in England and many European cities uh, uh, attracted a large uh, section of uh, uh, rural uh, economically, uh, the, the poor to the cities for better quality of life. Then the, the center of the city started uh, redensifying. And then after some point of time, the, the uh, periphery of the city started growing. And then it was found after some point of time, it was found that probably there is a limit to growth of the city. And also there is a need for a major change and overhaul of the infrastructure. And uh, also the change in use uh, of, of the city center and the other neighborhoods so that to bring back the economic vitality and social vigor to the city, so that uh, this become uh, this city is continue to serve the purpose of uh, multiple functions, uh, catering to the requirement of uh, booming uh, middle class and also working class population. So uh, what happened? Uh, you see, we have seen there are many uh, my personal experience with many. Uh, the Dutch cities like Utrecht and Harlem and many others, uh, several uh, medium-sized towns, which are basically very cozy, small uh, medieval towns, which uh, were affected by post-war uh, bombing and, and, and devastation. So they have gone for large-scale redevelopment with uh, uh, focus on mixed-use areas in the cent uh, central part of the city, uh, where all kinds of uh, purposes so, so that the people can work, leave, uh, uh, dine, and uh, watch the world go by. But uh, the, the ultimately what happened was uh, the, the, the focus was though more of a social and economic focus. But uh, during this process, uh, there was a big involvement because the, the resources was at crunch. There was a resource crunch was there. So there was federal fund uh, uh, was invested, but also there's a lot of private funds. So finally, this became this post war redevelopment became a very big business and a completely uh, different kind of modern buildings with a, a very high scale, high level of amenities that completely changed the city structure and also the, the kind of uh, uh, social life, social and economic life of the population. So the production, the precious spaces are produced and reproduced. And uh, there was a completely reconfiguration of the social composition and uh, also the, there is uh, development of conflicts and uh, uh, contestations over a very limited uh, land area in, in the core city. And in that, uh, I'd like to just highlight uh, one very infamous renewal that was in Richmond, USA, because you know all that USA was quite a racially differentiated country. And this is the one of the most infamous renewal which, were, which happened in Richmond where it was said that it has uh, actually, in the name of rejuvenation, actually it has uh, uh, renewed the inequality with uh, family displacement and uh, uh, racial segregation among the quarters. And this, this picture very vividly shows that there was forced uh, uh, displacement of the population uh, when these uh, workers' housing were dismantled to give a uh, way to new generation of uh, commercial, residential, and high-end uh, development. So this was more synonymous, became more synonymous with uh, displacement uh, from their homes and neighborhoods. Now, if we come to the Indian context, Indian context is the, the renewal started mostly after 1980s, when the old industrial cities uh, uh, started, uh, the, the old uh, manufacturing sector, uh, started declining and India was, and that happened in entire global south. The entire urbanization of global south is, is driven by informal, the service sector development and uh, real estate development. Uh, so, but the, the kind of form or the kind of concept they have used is the same compact high rise uh, urban form uh, just to, to uh, 
transform the production spaces to consumption spaces. So it is more like the same kind of narrative in terms of a built form or urban form, which was replicated, which was implanted here with a completely different kind of economy because the, the, the in West, the industrial, the uh, urbanization was driven by industrialization, whereas the urbanization in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which is happening after the 1980s more, more vigorously, that is driven by service sector development. So what we see is a great paradox or, or the kind of irony, uh, which is not there in, in case of the developed uh, nations for the global north. Here we have us the, the large scale change in the informal sector, uh, like uh, 70 or 80% of our workforce is in informal sector and uh, very large fragmented uh, uh, kind of uh, ownership of uh, business and also the, the land. Whereas this is being uh, uh, mediated with a very uh, standard generic and uh, formal codified kind of uh, uh, urban form, which is highly technocratic. And these are the basically, these are the, uh, the, the kind of characteristics what we have seen in the development of modern architecture, the use of uh, materiality, what we see in the buildings, the kind of uh, uh, dependence on uh, controlled environment, all things given same, so it's very difficult to sometimes differentiate between the Manhattan buildings and the buildings in Mumbai. And not only buildings, buildings means it's the embodiment of the kind of activities, what they are thinking, it's the same kind of activity pattern. Whereas we have here more of a hybrid economy and the activity uh, pattern is also influenced by the hybrid economy. We have a kind of uh, relation between formal and informal sector of, uh, of, of um, uh, commercial, uh, commercial development and housing, which was not in the case, uh, could not be addressed to these uh, codified generic model. So what we see here that uh, this, uh, the, the, uh, the very uh, um, prominent uh, example of this, uh, which started in uh, first time in the industrial cities, uh, like for example, in Mumbai, Mumbai, as you all know that the suburban area was, which was initially a suburban area, uh, uh, there were around uh, 60 number of textile mills, which were the economic backbone of Mumbai at one point of time. And uh, then after uh, 70s or 80s that those mills started uh, 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 closing down and they were, uh, in fact, they have been shifted to uh, the other peripheral uh, areas. And this suburban area, once the suburban area, and uh, initially it was a fishing village, then a suburban area, then the textile mills. And then it is in fact the this area has become the financial hub of uh, almost like India. So we have a very high value real estate, IT parks, and uh, also uh, the large financial hubs in the uh, lands of uh, textile mills. And this is completely uh, done by the through market interventions with uh, where the state more or less uh, was, was uh, kind of uh, enabling to a certain extent, but certainly the, 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 the uh, the lead was taken by the uh, very vibrant entrepreneurial culture of, of uh, Maharashtra. Coming to uh, Calcutta, it was not that, uh, probably not that vibrant economically, but still whatever was the opportunity was there, whenever we find any large land uh, of uh, industrial land where manufacturing, like this one is uh, the, the famous South City, which is probably the the most uh, uh, sought after destination for NRI Indians in Calcutta who have some base in Calcutta, they are just uh, after uh, they, they uh, jump to purchase uh, flats in, in, in uh, South City. That's the most uh, very uh, lucrative and very prestigious. And that actually replaced a very large uh, company or which was a manufacturing fan, fan manufacturing company of Usha, which is in the Southern part of Calcutta. In fact, that was more like a suburb at one point of time, but after 1980s with the, the development of major connecting roads and all, this has become almost like the, the highest land value area in the, in the southern part, which is the most prestigious part of the residential area now. So this is, though it is happening at a slightly smaller scale, but wherever it is getting the opportunity, this is completely changing the skyline and the completely changing not only the land use of a particular plot, 
but even the land price and other things are being completely uh, modified by this uh, single development. So entire activity pattern, the traffic behavior, the, the uh, uh, surrounding areas, the housing typology, everything is, is getting converted. And this area was earlier a middle class, middle income area that is being converted uh, uh, to a higher income group area. And this is a primarily a state driven uh, development. Same thing happened in, uh, in uh, uh, the uh, uh, Sabarmati Riverfront development. So this was actually a project of public space development. But what happened after this, uh, along with this public space development, because it had increased the land value and it uh, replaced a lot of informal settlements and opened up, unlocked a uh, very large amount of land. And this is probably all of you know, this is a very uh, important building of Sabarmati Riverfront House, which uh, accommodates the, uh, the very, uh, um, sort of the, the uh, advertised the, uh, the uh, convention centers and all kinds of uh, creative economy uh, uh, land uses, which makes this uh, area uh, the, the, a vibrant uh, public space in terms of a specific uh, type of land use and a specific category of, of population. So this is the kind of uh, thing. And uh, so uh, to summarize, this is primarily uh, these all these examples, what we are seeing, are are uh, basically they are they are remodeled in the line of uh, world class cities, and they become the the uh, uh, nodal spaces for circulation of global finance, at least the uh, the national financial capital, to make them investment friendly. And uh, all the cities are now uh, compete uh, for uh, getting the highest credit rating uh, from the agencies. And uh, this is possible by a, this is actually done by a kind of a homogeneous, uh, very uh, general kind of planning vision to attract private investment. So, so that was, in fact, uh, even before 1990s, this was, this was the kind of uh, uh, trend uh, after around the 1980s onwards. So this kind of urbanism, as uh, many of the theorists like, uh, Graham, Marvin, and others, they call it as, uh, there are various names to these, uh, splintering urbanism, where these, uh, or entrepreneurial urbanism, or enclave urbanism, where the, the main focus is on, on high value, uh, highest and best use of land. And uh, uh, these are more like uh, self-contained uh, uh, towns. So it is like smaller, smaller cities within a bigger city. So, so there are many cities within a city and uh, in the beginning, what happens, there is a coexistence with the lower income group uh, housing, but uh, there is also a gradually this is taken over by the higher income group housing. So the drivers, or we know that the drivers are primarily the urban reform, just to recapitulate that India with the, with the, with the, uh, uh, with the introduction of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Redevelopment Mission, most of the states have repealed the Urban Land Ceiling Act. There is 100% FDI is allowed in real estate. Then uh, there are relaxation of land use conversions on one hand, but there are again restrictions for the informal sector to settle. And there are cut off dates for slums so that there is this, the people, the informal sector population from outside are now onwards, from 90s onwards, they're not really, uh, there's the free flow of population is, is uh, checked. Uh, by cutoff dates and all. And finally, this is being institutionalized by urban infrastructure governance uh, that is part of the January mission. And uh, the smart cities, which uh, institutionalized this whole concept to the uh, area-based development where the, the entire smart city uh, money, uh, the 80% or 90% of the money is invested in uh, three or 4%, which can give maximum return. So just, these are the kind of drivers and then the market took up and, and uh, uh, did the rest. So this, uh, so what is what is that the general traits or uh, the general features that uh, all almost in all these minerals, whether it is in Gurgaon or whether it is in Bangalore or Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, everywhere. This is more of a generic. This is not uh, very specific to a particular uh, context. Or uh, so, so this is very generic, and there is a close alliance of state and market. To, to utilize the resource uh, for, for a specific 
segment of the of the uh, of the market and the growth is highly speculative probably all of you know that uh, the major mr renewal which happened in mumbai or many other places um, even after that almost 2 lakh housing units in mumbai is lying vacant and that is in the higher income group sector whereas we have a 55% of the population living in informal sector so this is a speculative growth is a general character then the the uh, the, the other traits are highest and best use of land in terms of uh, land value and also in terms of the the uh, uh, in terms of commercial use of land uh, for the best use of land then transaction value taking precedence over use value the existing use value some use value was there but uh, the, the focus is here is more on the transaction value and uh, also the institutionally what we have seen the parastatal are the prime actors like some kind of parastatal agency where the this government is maybe one uh, stakeholder or maybe special purpose vehicle so this is these are the two kinds of uh, uh, in institutional uh, structure which uh, facilitated ensured this and the impacts uh, are are quite well known so what we see here the special large scale special restructuring intense gentrification what we see uh, of of the people who are the original users because the use value is taken replaced by the transaction value and uh, the cities uh, are more of an investment market now city is a market for housing but city is also primarily an investment market so that is leading to intense gentrification high socio spatial inequality if you check the uh, amount of land which is available to the economically weaker section be it in mumbai or or calcutta or delhi it's around 5 to 6% of the land uh, which is occupied by more than 40 or 50% of the population mostly in the mega city so 40 to 50% of the mumbai it is like 55% in 7% of the land if there is no much not there is any change in the in the uh existing situation but this is the general trend that uh, huge uh, there's a skewed uh, relationship of the number of population and uh, the amount of land at their disposal amount of this so disruption of livelihoods of the poor and marginalized uh, which uh, and this is being amply demonstrated by this uh, covid situation where we have seen almost uh, uh, crores of people uh, population who are the city makers they had to go back and they had no place to live in the city which is uh, probably before this this was uh, there was some doubt about this uh, but uh, this is two times when the lockdown happened this is made amply clear that yes disruption happened even if they are allowed they are allowed at the mercy of some of their employers but they the employers do not want to take any responsibility when there is some kind of uh, 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 some kind of closing down or some emergency happens there's no one to take care of them so there is complete uh, marginalization breaking up of communities and degradation of social capital in fact for the social capital they have to go back to the, the village so it's like economic capital for which they come to the city but there is no social capital so for that they they went back to the city and what you see is it's basically a kind of a fragmented or or a assorted city so there is hardly any city ness city is is a very is a term where actually there has to be a public ness or a city ness or public purpose or function so i'm just gradually moving towards the closing part of my my uh, um, thoughts so yes the driver is that the cities are thought as an engines of growth uh, certainly but uh, engine of growth in a highly contested landscape the highly contested because uh, this is there is large amount of fragmentation in terms of ownership in terms of use so it's highly contested and because of service uh, sector development because of informalization the number of stakeholders has also increased probably where it was there probably one stakeholder that has increased the number of stakeholders with middleman and other stakeholders kept coming into the picture because the entire governance also become uh, informal so when the governance become informal the number of stakeholders also increases so the big question is is uh, engines of growth certainly it is very important but uh, actually and finally it is happening for whom so this is the big question so i'm just suggesting uh, in a in a conceptual way that uh, for social resilience 
we need to uh, think uh, radically because it is a private property owned city. So, um, uh, and it is, I know that this is quite difficult, but unless this is taken care of, and that is why this post COVID situation, government is also concerned and uh, bringing about some kind of changes in the, in the rules of the game. Like earlier government was interested more to oriented towards ownership housing. Government is now moving more towards uh, the, the thinking about at least the, uh, uh, the rental housing and all. So I suggested here this change is seven changes in the rules of the game very quickly. So the strategy should be evidence-based. It should not be generic. And uh, it should be backed up by, by strong data and uh, the, the vulnerability assessment of different sections of population in the city. So that's the first thing which is very important. The strategy should be evidence-based. Uh, we need to balance the efficiency. Till now, in the, in the globalization uh, era, the focus is actually on efficiency. Uh, how efficient the land use may be, how efficient the service provision may be. And probably we have shifted from universal basic services. So we, we, we need to, to tie them together. The efficiency is important for, for a larger mega city to function. That's no, no denying of that. But uh, equity is, is equally important. So that is what is, is very uh, critical balance efficiency with equity. Redistribution of land is important and uh, services and, and focus should be, uh, growth is important, but equally important is the livability, the quality of life. So there's too much of emphasis on minimum standard and depending on the land value or land price of the car, city, like in Mumbai, the minimum standard housing is reduced to say 250 square feet, whereas in uh, uh, the uh, periphery, it may be 350 square feet. So as the, the it comes to the inner city areas, the minimum standard reduces. And in the process, what happened? Uh, there's a complete uh, 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 dislocation of the population and complete uh, uh, disruption of their existing livelihoods. So more important should be sustaining the communities rather than only the minimum standard. The focus should shift from only from land monetization to livelihood and social security, because otherwise, this uh, any kind of adverse situation or uh, this kind of uh, problem, what we are now going to, this is uh, going to come back uh, as a, as a uh, again, that the kind of threats or challenges is going to come back. Segmentation to integration, which probably we have lost the track. The, our cities are segmented and, and uh, very important is that uh, we need to, to change towards the co-production of cities. And that is probably one of the reasons why this, even this the, the master plans, what the Delhi master plan is also now doing a lot of consultation. So public consultation, public hearing. Now this is now really being uh, considered that uh, a city like Delhi, the master plan cannot be prepared without large scale public consultation with the uh, civil society, society organization. And there is a need to learn from them because 50% of the population is there, they are, uh, they, they are at stake. So what, what, what we, we do about them? So I just change with this, uh, I just uh, conclude that, is it possible to change the rules of the game? Certainly it's easier said than done. It's, it's not that easy uh, considering the increase in number of stakeholders, what we see here. But there may be uh, some clues which we can use. Like for example, in Mumbai, uh, at some point of time in the probably it is, if I'm not wrong, in the middle of 80s, uh, famous architect Charles Korea, uh, he reiterated, and that's just saying also in the post COVID uh, rethinking of cities, that we need to reinvent the social function of cities and public use of land. So, what is suggested in case of Mumbai that a one third formula, one third formula means the, the, the existing mills should give one third of the land, keep one third of the land for their uh, uh, redevelopment. One third of the land should come back to the city authority for uh, public open space and various kinds of public activities, transportation, roads, and other things. And one third should go for social housing. So that was a very, a very ideal socialistic concept, but probably uh, 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 there is no other way to uh, uh, to ignore this in the in this present context of the crisis, what we are facing, and we have also seen 
uh, many Latin American cities, they are experimenting. In fact, they have, done, they have, uh, they have some of their cities, countries have their city statute, like Mexico, Colombia, and many Brazilian cities, they have the city statute. So the city, local governance in the city became in, important and they have their own statute uh, so that the, the, uh, uh, the, the role of the informal sector is accepted and the social purpose of city is brought back and they have used concepts like inclusive zoning and uh, all sorts of things, which may not be a very ideal solution. I should not say this is an ideal solution because they have to compromise maybe on other aspects. But uh, the thing what they tried was that the compromise, since the, the entire redevelopment cost should not be uh, borne by the, uh, the, the poorest of the people. So that is their, their focus. So in fact, this was also highlighted in the in, in the uh, Quito uh, declaration uh, in the in the last uh, uh, habitat conference. So uh, we need to to change the rules of the game, but there needs to be some some convergence of of uh, opinion, and there should be some uh, agreement to this changing the rules of the game. And the focus should be more on social function of cities and public use of land because. Uh, everything is privatized and segmented, so that that cannot go on uh, uh, without any any uh, challenge. So I just end with this. So we have a huge diversity with all kinds of business, all kinds of population, uh, starting from vegetable vendors, uh, different kind of occupations within the city, and uh, really what we need is the large section of population have rural background they came from the rural areas in search of better livelihood and a city is a is a healthy city where everybody has some opportunity to, to thrive upon then only it will become a socially and economically uh, vibrant and and uh, uh, resilient city so i just end with uh, this uh, that the city should nurture democracy uh, discussion and 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 uh, taking uh, cognizance of the, the all the citizens, democracy and diversity, probably if we have these two pillars uh, in, in our city development process, uh, then probably we have some answer or some model of social resilience, which may not be an ideal situation, but probably the most optimal situation where everybody will have something to, to gain from the city and something to contribute to the city. So I just end with a, very famous quote from our um, uh, famous urban sociologist, Jen Jacobs, that cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everyone. Uh, thank you for your uh, patient hearing. And, and uh, yeah, I like to now uh, listen to all your opinion and, and, and your uh, comments. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Professor Roy, for that uh, very good presentation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you have very aptly uh, mentioned uh, some of the most important uh, problems uh, that Indian cities are, are experiencing. Uh, the, I think the most important uh, thing that is emerging from your presentation is, uh, is the fact that uh, the current approaches uh, that, uh, uh, that are being uh, employed by the city governments or the state governments for the improvement of cities are leading to further inequalities among the social classes that live in cities. It is as if that uh, more work is being done for the uh, rich and the middle income uh, classes and less work is being done for uh, the marginalized sections of the society, the economically weaker sections, the poor population. Uh, and uh, although uh, you yourself would be familiar about some of the initiatives that have been undertaken uh, to in, 
address the concerns of this section of the society to which we will come in the discussion and later on. Uh, but you have rightly pointed out some of the irregularities in governance and management that exists and even in the planning system uh, that is being adopted in uh, the improvement of cities. Uh, so uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, the discussions, uh, the discussions uh, of today's program. And I would like to begin uh, with uh, inviting by inviting uh, Dr. Ashima Sood. Uh, Ashima is Associate Professor at Anand National University, Ahmedabad. And we would like to, uh, we look forward to uh, hearing your opinion on the speaker's presentation, uh, in particular and in general about your own uh, work on this topic uh, uh, you might have covered or looked into from time to time uh, about the, the, the challenges that exist in terms of uh, addressing the concerns highlighted by Professor Roy. Uh, may I invite Professor uh, Sood? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Roy, for that you know, wonderful, really comprehensive, I think, uh, you know, evaluation of the state of uh, the Indian inner city, particularly. And of course, thank you, uh, Dr. Ajaz. I think, uh, you know, very nice summary and sort of comments and you know, um, I wanted to address a uh, uh, number of uh, points that uh, Professor Roy, you had a chance to touch upon, but perhaps not fully elaborate. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to ask was, you know, I, I, there is this um, quote by uh, Gavin Shatkin in Liza Weinstein and uh, Neha Sami, if I'm not wrong. And they have this uh, very interesting formulation that, you know, Indian cities tend to be overplanned, overregulated, and undergoverned. Right, and uh, that's sort of a quote that has stayed with me. And um, I do wonder, and I wanted your perspective on, uh, you know, how do you see this play out in the uh, inner city? And I'm thinking about this also in the context of my own work, where I've really focused on the periphery, right? And in the periphery, by definition, there is no municipal corporation, right? Uh, or if there is, there are sort of these new municipalities that are coming up, for example, on the peripheries of Hyderabad, which is really the landscape that I know best. Um, but, uh, you know, in the inner city where there is, uh, you know, municipal government, there is, of course, uh, you know, some notion of elected representative government. Um, you know, at least the work of people like Solly Benjamin shows us that, you know, poor groups have traditionally had the ability uh, to, uh, you know, claim, make claims, right? Even if they're not able to assert entitlement for rights, but they are able to make claims. Um, and of course, I also wanted and was hoping to hear your reflections on um, how this has played out with, you know, this kind of um, transition and evolution that Partha Chatterjee's work has, uh, you know, laid out. And this is very much about the politics of planning. Uh, which is to say that, you know, um, there was a way in which in the 1970s, till the 1970s, even till the 1980s, poor groups were accommodated within the heart of the city. But then as you're describing, you know, sort of these transformations, the, you know, uh, the industrialization of the inner city core uh, has also meant that poor groups have been increasingly pushed away to the periphery. And so I, I would love to hear your reflections on some of the governance aspects of this. Uh, particularly in the center center cities or center cities. Um, I think the, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, just uh, uh, two more points and I'll try to be quite brief in the points I make. One is, you know, I think I, I was really intrigued by your mention of Jane Jacobs and it's, uh, of course, Jane Jacobs has had a tremendous influence uh, in uh, cities of the global north and she sort of, in a way, uh, I was reading, you know, really led this movement of, you know, anti-planning in a way, right? The whole idea of new urbanism and, of course, that has led to new kinds of uh, pathologies of gentrification. Uh, but in a way, you know, the sort of Jane Jacobs moment has never arrived in the Indian context. And so I wanted to, uh, you know, hear your thoughts on that. And then finally, I was curious also because since you mentioned some of these theoretical paradigms which I've used uh, in my own work, whether it's splintering urbanism or whether it's speculative urbanism or entrepreneurial sort of urbanism, 
Um, you know, how does this again, I mean, once again, a lot of this literature is basically think about Goldman's work or the way that, you know, Matthew Dikovla has written about Bangalore's electronicity. Uh, this is sort of very much on the periphery, right? Peripheral uh, development. And so once again, um, I think it's really fascinating to see how you're deploying a lot of these concepts to describe processes that are happening within sort of what we describe or think of as a city, city center. So thank you so much again for that stimulating uh, presentation. Yeah, should I should I uh, respond uh, to the points? Uh... Yeah, I think it's a good idea to briefly yeah, yeah, respond yeah, yeah, yeah. to the many questions raised yeah. by Dr. Soames. Please. Yeah, actually, uh, what uh, Professor Shu has rightly mentioned that uh, there is some sort of planning, at least in the inner city, in terms of services, in terms of some level of zoning and other and Obviously, in the periphery, the, the, uh, the criticality of the situation is even worse. But what happens, you know, that uh, that is certainly that you have mentioned about over planning. So most of the cases, what, what is seen that uh, this zoning, uh, there is a politics of zoning, you know. It's, it's, uh, so, and obviously, the kind of uh, what happened probably in the earlier times when in the, in the 1980s, when Victoria actually suggested this, probably there was some, some constituency or some audience, and the, the number of stakeholders were not this much fragmented what it is now. So the number of interest groups have largely increased after the, uh, after the, the, the uh, liberalization. So there are various uh, interest groups, and in fact, this varies from city to city. Probably the interest group, the number of interest groups in Mumbai is much larger and much different from what is happening in uh, the Western uh, the states and the Eastern states like in Calcutta may not be that problematic. So what we see here, probably in Calcutta still there is a kind of consensus, even among the middle class population that uh, yes, we, we need that, uh, we don't think that the slums will not be, because I still live in a middle, uh, in a in a mixed income area, and I don't feel much of a problem to listen to Ajahn or listen to the the Hindu uh, uh, chantings uh, occasionally. So that actually uh, it, it uh, really the, is what becomes important because the, the city space is not that transactional in Calcutta, which is highly transactional, and the use value is very least in in Mumbai. So that that's why we. Well, see so much of uh, speculative uh, housing, which hardly finds uh, any any taker. That much is not here. So probably that in that sense it is planned. What you see as a what you say as a more planned than that. Probably Calcutta is less planned than Mumbai, and uh, uh, probably the, that is a dichotomy. Yes, I I, I know. But probably uh, too much of planning uh, is may lead to uh, a, a very different situation where this whole output or the outcome is taken over the, the result is actually the benefiting the elite and uh, the the uh, exclusion further of the of the poor so that is the, the impact of over planning I, I i i i am an urban planner but i know that uh, sometimes we, we do not have probably do not have any uh, because this, this planning we, uh, we do not actually control the decision uh, because that is being mostly uh, dictated by the market and the state is actually enabling the market through all kinds of this thing that, because you know that in Calcutta, in West Bengal, uh, the government tried to resist this uh, re repeal of the ultra. And most of these uh, inequalities, what we are finding in Calcutta and also in Mumbai uh, is probably after the repeal of ultra, uh, there is a need now to really look into what ultra has done. It was said that ultra will unlock land even for economically weaker section. So there is a need to really, really look into what is the impact of ultra in Mumbai and what is the impact of ultra in other medium-sized towns. So this is certainly the, the planning for whose uh, who's interest. This is a big question. And over planning may lead to uh, further marginalization. And where there is less planning, probably uh, we find a more of a coexistence rather than country. Coming to Jane Jacobs saying, yes, certainly uh, is this. Uh, Jane Jacobs thing could not be could not be implemented here, uh, but what we see here uh, is that uh, uh, 
I, I'll not say in, in exactly in Jane Jacob terms, but there are certain slum renewal programs, uh, which was tried in the 80s and even the late uh, early 90s also in Calcutta, uh, when there was no BSUP or nothing like that, when there was a Calcutta services for the poor. So almost all the slums are retained within the uh, old neighborhoods. And even they, they are still uh, there. Uh, but in some parts like uh, uh, the South City where it has happened, uh, because that development came, the cascading effect actually changed the whole lot of land use. And probably now it is much easier for the, the, the uh, they are uh, just removed without any further push. So uh, probably uh, in design terms, what Jen Jacobs told might not have been have happened here, but because of the pro uh, poor service delivery, this might have uh, actually uh, uh, means, uh, appropriated this, uh, implemented this uh, Jane Jacobs concept in, in terms of retaining the eyes on the streets, because still these mixed use, uh, mixed uh, income communities are much more uh, safe, as Jane Jacobs told, that the, the more the eyes on the streets, and that exactly we find in Calcutta, the exclusive Salt Lake, which is completely residential, and uh, higher and middle income group housing is uh, less safer than the places which are mixed use areas. So probably without any intervention, uh, what you see as a new town is less uh, uh, secure than uh, old uh, unplanned areas. So that's, that, is, that is the kind of thing. And uh, finally, the splintering urbanism and all this probably this uh, is, is uh, I'll not go into the details of theories, uh, but yes, uh, the splintering urbanism and this kind of things are mostly this is uh, this is talking about uh, that uh, they are all self-contained. Basically, they, 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 contain, they talk about self-containment and they are highly connected among themselves. That is what uh, the splintering urbanism or network urbanism says, that they are highly contained and they have all kinds of uh, supports like uh, law and order, 24-hour uh, electric, everything. So they do not have to depend for everyday uh, uh, survival on anything outside. So that is, and, and uh, same is that uh, entrepreneurial or, so they can be interchangeably used to this whole issue of uh, the kind of organization what we are, we are finding. So, so that's my, my uh, observation. Thank you so much. I think uh, lots to think about. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Sood and Dr. Rao for, for that discussion. Uh, I would like to invite, uh, Professor Tathagata Chatterjee, who is with the Xavier University in Bhubaneswar, to give his impressions about today's talk. And also, uh, if uh, there are some experiences to be shared, uh, you may please uh, uh, share with, with the audience. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ajaz. And, um, uh, so broadly, I mean, agreement with what uh, Dr. Roy has said, actually, I mean, we are co-authors on so many papers. So we have a convergence of views on many areas. Um, so um, uh, coming to this issue, but uh, about uh, urban renewal and uh, its social implications. So I'd like to highlight a couple of issues. Uh, is that Urban renewal um, after the beginning of uh, uh, economic liberalization, globalization in a big way, uh, certain contextual differences. Uh, in the West, uh, urban renewal that happened in the 1980s and 90s, uh, uh, it was mostly, I mean, no, I'm not talking about post-war uh, urban renewal that was uh, more of uh, social housing, etc. But here, um, it was mostly about uh, regeneration of old industrial sites, the old production spaces turning into consumption spaces for a new white collar economy because uh, due to globalization, the uh, old production uh, uh, areas has moved to uh, cheaper destinations. But those also had some amount of gentrification. Uh, 
uh, but here in indian context uh, this kind of urban renewal can be seen only in the in two indian cities in big way one is bombay the second is calcutta which are both products of the uh, early industrial revolution so both bombay and calcutta were originally uh, the sites of colonial uh, mercantile capitalism and had some of the features about um, the spatial structure which has got resemblances with many of the industrial cities of the global north in terms of location of the industries in the heart of the city uh, location of the warehouses and um, uh, very close proximity to the uh, business uh, districts now uh, unlike in the western context where this change has happened due to the industries has moved out and this areas did not had large numbers of people so there had been some amount of gentrification all right but that scale had been quite low uh, mostly those were degenerated industrial sites but in indian context when the uh, jute mills in bombay uh, uh, in uh, calcutta uh, jute and uh, engineering industries in calcutta started uh, decaying for various political reasons i'm not going into those aspects or the textile mills started moving out from bombay uh, what had happened that the people there has turned into informal sector so what we see in the calcutta larger calcutta metropolitan area not uh, within calcutta city proper uh, to uh, mo but mostly in the larger industrial belt of howrah etc is that the uh, factories has moved uh, has become uh, defunct but the workers have remained in the surrounding areas and they have turned into uh some sort of uh, informal sector activities to keep their livelihoods alive now this kind of thing is not visible in the western cities um in the western city the first major uh, urban renewal of this kind happened is the london docklands project um uh, uh, in the 1970s and 80s but there the planning agency the uh, london i mean uh, there was a special purpose uh, agency was formed london uh, docklands development authority so the development authority played a overarching master planning role within which uh, the uh, urban renewal happened i had been to another very interesting project that is a vastra haman project in malmo in sweden where there was a when the uh, ship building industry and the volvo car manufacturing factories moved out that area was turned out again into a large scale um, uh, redevelopment having housing as well as office as well as uh, uh, retail uh, etc etc but the happened within an overarching planning framework by uh, the local planning agency so oh, uh, that is the uh, idea that charles korea when uh, i incidentally had some uh, discussions with charles korea uh, in one of his i mean i'm very fortunate to have talked about, with him uh, just few months before uh, he passed away so uh, when he proposed that you know i mean this um, uh one third formula which professor roy has very rightly mentioned uh is that he also was envisaging there would be an important role for the state that the state would play as an arbitrator to bring back the some of the spaces which had been used for industries to back for public use for a city like bombay which is very much uh, short of uh, public spaces and of course one third of the space should be given to the workers who had of the uh, uh, textile mills who had lost their jobs but after the supreme court judgment that came out I mean, 
the state role has changed so state instead of trying to use the land for public purpose the role of the state character of the state itself has changed and state itself became uh, increased and since then it has uh, become even more a partner in capital accumulation for the few for the uh, uh, real estate lobby now coming to the situation in case of calcutta i mean calcutta also faced a similar situation where there is a large numbers of industrial areas which have remained defunct so the uh, left front government time there were some moves to redevelop some of these areas which eventually led to the uh, south city development um, uh, in uh, south calcutta which is a very uh, now that area which was earlier the uh, usha factory but now that is a prime part of the city and under no circumstances you can have a factory industrial activity in that kind of an area uh, but uh, so that area was redeveloped into uh, high rise uh, multi story uh, apartment buildings but after couple of such projects there were a backlash that the the left front government is becoming anti uh, uh worker so the government came out with a uh, uh, regulation which uh, stopped conversion of industrial land use to other kind of land use but unfortunately what had happened i mean after again the change of the government that there have that forces have uh, changed and what would have would have happened through a larger planning framework has now become completely uh, informalized so now even though there is a, a ban on conversion of uh, industrial land use to other use the, what has happened it's happening on the ground is a very micro scale network politics between the municipal uh, level political actors uh, local uh, real estate property interests and uh, very uh, local uh, level uh, neighborhood scale uh, operatives uh, so which are playing out Uh, to turn that area uh, 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 so in, uh, a new kind of language of urban development has come up that is completely informalized so the uh, what could have been possible through a large scale uh, state led planning initiative that uh, opportunity has been lost and now that area has become i mean the entire rule of the game has become informal so this brings up to this issue of uh, what dr ashima sood has very rightly mentioned it's about the path to chatterjee's uh, concept of the political society now the character of the political society itself is going through a uh, change so and uh, there is a very strong dependence between the uh, political society and its uh, uh, and the uh, uh, informal sector so there is a patron client relationship so that patron client relationship uh, has got more strengthened after the change of the regime so that uh, brings us to the Uh, the quality of the regime and the regime characteristics on the uh, character of uh, how, how the uh, uh, urban renewal pans out so i with this i would uh, stop for the moment uh, like to hear others thank you professor chatterji for those uh, very useful points that you put forward uh, i'm sure uh, you have been in discussion with professor roy about many of these aspects and uh, these continue to pose challenges as governments and uh, 
planning agencies move forward in their work. Uh, I, I would like to now invite uh, a practitioner uh, who has been a part of the local government in Shimla and has uh, tremendous experience of uh, uh, looking very closely about the issues of governance, uh, not only in a hill city, but also in other parts of the country, uh, being in his position uh, to, to give his views on today's topic of discussion, Mr. Tikender Singh Panbar. Hi, Rumi. So good to see you, and I'm so glad. I mean, you've not increased even a bit of uh, weight since I last saw you. I and mean, what do you do, Rumi? I mean, it's so difficult to. I mean, we've been getting weight during the pandemic, and you're just the same. I mean, it's so nice to hear your voice. So thank you so much for uh, for inviting me, and I'm extremely sorry, Arjun, and uh, our team in Impri that I tried several times, but because of this uh, uh, intermittent network, I was unable to get through and I was completely absent from uh, from Professor Roy's uh, presentation. So uh, please pardon me for uh, for not being able to actually comment on on, on the presentation. And uh, unfortunately, I, I am not a discussant to this presentation, but what I could make out from what uh, Ashima was, uh, Ashima said and uh, what uh, Professor Tathagata was also uh, saying, I think uh, there are just three elements that I want to add. And uh, when we speak, uh, when we talk about redevelopment, and actually that I will share from some of my anecdotal uh, experiences, as uh, Rumi has pointed out, while serving the town for five years in Simla, and now uh, part of a team that we uh, that we are building a vision document for lay i mean it's already done i mean so so kind of narrative and alternatives that we do so i think the first thing that is uh, that that we that we are uh, witnessing uh, in the last few years uh, especially post 90s uh, if if we see this journey and the trajectory of uh, uh, you know urban development i go back to charles corey as professor tatagata was uh, pointing out and because uh, I was able to actually uh, go through some of the documents of the first urban commission which Professor uh, Charles uh, which Charles Korea was heading and fortunately we have one of the lone surviving members uh, that's Kirti Bhai and so so it's also because of uh, uh, several interactions with Kirti Bhai that uh, we I mean we just tried to understand how the first urban commission uh, in fact the first and probably the last because we didn't have any urban commission after that but the, but the driving force of the first urban commission and actually the foundation of the urban commission, if you see the recommendations of the first urban commission, that is that they are viewing city from a perspective and from a lens, a city where, which is a manufacturing hub, which is a kind of an industrial city. And you know, all, all those layers of urban development uh, uh, actually are built on, uh, on, 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 on this basic premise. But 30 years, 35 or 40 years down the line, we have seen actually uh, the cities uh, uh, do not remain to be the industrial centers. And in fact, it is uh, the reproduction of capital. I mean, not, not the, the, the accumulation of capital in the, in the classical sense of, uh, of production processes that takes place, uh, but in, in various other forms and some of the Italian uh, left oriented planners who have been pointing out that the city must be treated as a factory. In fact, the city got converted into a factory. So that's the first first thing that I wanted to uh, point out. So there's huge informality, huge, humongous amount of informality that we witness in the cities. And uh, But uh, we also find that, uh, you know, the bargaining power of uh, the working class vis-a-vis -vis the state or vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, various structures of the state also substantially reduced. Uh, that has to do somewhat also uh, to to one of the important uh, manifestations of uh, of this transformation that was taking place. Uh, uh, small units, informal, I mean, more informal sector, uh, large production centers getting reduced. I mean, we hardly find any cotton mills. I mean, the strength of the working class that we used to see in Delhi you know, for that matter, where thousands and thousands of workers used to work in the one group. And uh, so we know how, how uh, and what, what, what led to that transformation. So that also led to a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, 
uh, of, of a change in the political environment. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that that's that's the first part. I think the second part also is quite connected to the first one, and and that happens to be, and that's what when I was there in, in the town and uh, witnessed uh, in 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 very uh, vivid proportions, and that happens to be, you know, what the political economy we term as use value. The transformation of use value into exchange value. I mean, co sheer commoditization of some of uh, the essential elements, and you know, this whole bunch of knowledge networks uh, uh, creating a halo around uh, city governance. That look, uh, this is the way. I mean, I mean, how how you to govern the city? And let me just cite a few examples. Take for example, water. I mean, is water a need or a right? So water uh, was considered to be. I mean, this, this is this is the argument that look, uh, uh, water is a kind of uh, of need, and I mean, uh, you, uh, I mean, so the state is not uh, the, the sole responsible uh, player in 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 this entire uh, uh, in, in this entire process. So you can have. You know, and better governance, better governance models in which uh, there's humongous amount of money that gets accumulated just in 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 in, in, the, in the process of water distribution and water generation. And simultaneously, we find uh, two important sectors: health and education. I mean, just last year, uh, Rumi, if you if you remember, when we have the Navratras, despite the fact that we have uh, we had COVID. Uh, but during the Navratras, you you must have witnessed that you know, the full-page advertisements of Amazons, and you know, and we can we can imagine I mean, what what the, the sheer amount of money that is required to actually uh, ensure those advertisements on the front page of your leading dailies. But all of a sudden, those Amazons were gone, and we found uh, the Amazons were taken. And this is during the Navratras. Uh, the Amazons were taken uh, away by 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 Jews and uh, Vedantus, you know, because we had the neat result uh, uh, and immediately after the neat result. So we can so there's uh, almost ten thousand to eleven thousand more uh, 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 venture funds that are that are entering into the sector. So this complete absence of the state uh, and also of the of the local governance that we find in some of these utilities where uh, there's huge, huge amount of inequity, inequality that gets creeped in, and the huge amount of informality that uh, gets creeped in. So, uh, uh, so, so that that's that's I think I think the second part, uh, which is which is important. the third part, which uh, which I would like to uh, focus on is uh, you know while serving the city. Uh, and this is one of the one of the important lessons uh, which which we learned. And you know there are many players. And I remember uh, the the present uh, present vice president of India, who was the then minister of urban development. And he all um, several times that we have uh, uh, been interacting. And then he said, you know, the municipal uh, bodies do not have uh, any funds, so they over they they go, they reach out to the provincial governments. That's the state government. The state governments also do not have funds, so they reach out to the central government. The central government also do not have funds, so they go to the multilateral institutions. And then you find this nexus uh, uh, unfolding in some of the larger uh, larger cities where you find they will come, not even larger, even in smaller cities, when, when you'll find, okay, your city sanitation plan, you do not know how to uh, you know, plan, uh, 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 plan sanitation in, in, in the town. So, okay, we'll plan for you. And this is exactly precisely what we were witnessing in JNNURM, and the worst form is the smart city model that we are witnessing. I mean, it's completely taken over even the the you know, the minimum minimum responsibility that the city councils had in the process of planning, or you know, if, even deciding, I mean, democratically deciding, okay, what should be the priority and how low that priority might have been. So. Okay, so city sanitation plan, city mobility plan, and whatnot. I mean, city development plans. You just look at these plans. I mean, who are the ones who are pla pla who are uh, uh, instrumental into preparing these plans? So they, they know you do not have the capacity. Okay, we will plan for you. And then we take for example Simla. I mean, let me cite that example. Simla mobility plan is six thousand crores. The population is two hundred thousand. We get four point five million tourists. We know the per capita. <clears throat> Uh, in, income. So where the hell is going to uh, is six thousand crore rupees uh, going to come from? Then they say, okay, we'll we'll find some 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 agency. I mean, 
So, so uh, they, they will create your DPRs, they will create your plans, and that's how they will focus on more capital intensive technologies. If you see these sanitation plans, if you see these mobility plans, most of these plans which are created by these consultants are actually focusing on greater capital intensive technologies. Tell me in, in how many towns in, in, in uh, towns or in the cities in the in the country is uh, uh, is metro a uh, viable solution? But we find metros are something which are really pushed forward, and we're not realizing that. I mean, it's completely impossible to sustain such a system in in in, in the middle east of that. So I think that has also led to uh, um, this whole bunch of redevelopment that we are witnessing uh, in the cities also has led to this this great inequality that we are witnessing. And I think uh, the hollowness of uh, our planning structures uh, was uh, like completely exposed uh, last year when the lockdown was announced. And in just 24 hours, the 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 the, the, mic, uh, the migrant population. The, they started moving back, realizing that if they, uh, if, they if, 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 if they if they remain in the in, in the town, they will starve to death. It's better to walk, yeah, even if, if if that that that's that's a that's a very big challenge. So I think, and and then when when we talk about smart cities, because smart cities we all know is uh, is something which is SPV led, and in none of these special purpose vehicles do we find the elected council as a part of uh, the SPVs. It's more. Uh, either consultant driven or bureaucrat driven, which is focusing more on area based development, again, to do with for a very, very small proportion population in the town. And I think these are not just unsustainable, this, but this further widens the inequality in the towns uh, and in the cities. So uh, I think with that, uh, uh, Rumi, please pardon me because uh, I was I was uh, uh, I, I was unable to uh, uh, participate or, or listen to what uh, Professor Rao, uh, Professor uh, Sovik uh, Roy's presentation. But I think to me, what is important is if we have to uh, uh, challenge this situation, I think the challenge has to come from more democratization. The challenge has to come from where we plan uh, with the participation of the people. And we, the challenge has to come from uh, the the from from actually the processes the processes that that have to be challenged not leaving the planning process to you know large uh, consultants and large transnational corporations but uh, I, mean, I mean drawing uh, the, uh, the, 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 the the local level board level uh, uh, planning models and then actually building layers on that and this is what Samuel Stein has been saying. I mean, there's a fabulous book that he wrote on, of course, that is in the American context, the capital city where he uh, writes, I mean, we planners are not corrupt, but you know, uh, the, the politics and, and, uh, uh, and, and the political economy of the system actually makes us uh, uh, create cities, the cities that are completely uh, unlivable, that are completely unsustainable for the common people. I think, I think with, with that, thanks uh, uh, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Panwar. I think uh, you did an excellent job uh, within a short time. Uh, you highlighted uh, some very relevant points and particularly about your point about the current priorities of the uh, governments at whatever levels and the uh, inadequate attention paid to the uh, weaker sections of the society. So uh, uh, those are valuable lessons, uh, not only for Professor Roy, but for everyone who's participating in this discussion. Uh, I would like now to turn to the most experienced uh, panelists uh, in today's discussion. And uh, the reason I am uh, inviting uh, uh, the panelists towards the end is that uh, it would be uh, best to hear her uh, opinion of, of the work that she has been doing over the years on these and related subjects. And also, uh, uh, what is it that the speaker might like to pay further attention to? And how can this, uh, uh, this discussion or this subject that is chosen for today's discussion, how can this be enriched further? So over to Professor Shipra Metra.
thanks uh, very much good evening everybody uh, thanks very much to rumi for this uh, over hyped uh, introduction <laughs> so i am really grateful for that uh, but actually uh, uh, it is not uh, i cannot claim to be uh, to have much knowledge on it but uh, uh, to congratulations to professor rai for this uh, excellent presentation highlighting the no uh, most important issues of city development and planning and i have been enriched by listening to the all the discussions uh, after that now uh, what we here uh, see is that this is the uh, the dichotomy between the uh, economic growth and the city development which professor roy has highlighted this is actually in the core of uh, Uh, urban development and town planning and delhi has been a uh, very Im uh, important example of that it actually began uh, from uh, before independence when two architects uh, were given a uh, charge of delhi one is uh, patrick gedes who insisted or uh, insisted on local area development keeping all his uh, ponds and the uh, Uh, all the natural resources intact with the community involvement so that the areas like old delhi and uh, this shahjahanabad before uh, independence could uh, have its own local vibrant uh, development along uh, keeping that local ecosystem vibrant and taking part of the local economic activity in local ma ma markets and all he did not want to disturb that local economy and local drive on the other hand uh, we uh, had uh, lachians delhi who uh, developed uh, new delhi in a completely uh, out of uh, the which was not there in delhi before all this uh, opulence and it's a beautiful work i'm not uh, saying that it is a, it has import, uh, it has uh, Uh, improved the visibility of delhi and it has become a landmark uh, delhi the president's house and all this uh, raisna hills and all that but these two development from that point actually uh, presented that dichotomy in delhi the inequality in delhi the uh, different development dispersal in delhi which actually continued after that uh we will not be uh, very unfair to the master plan concept when we say that the first master plan uh, with the dds land policy they actually began on the 50% land to the ews and it was 50 25 25 50% percent for the ews development 25 to the middle and other and 25 for the auction this is how it began but how it failed is that that there were several cooperative uh, societies and all which took the land and which did not develop uh, which left it so that dda came into housing construction and we all know the history of delhi the slow construction led to the development of uh, slums and all other uh, negative uh, urbanization i may say now when delhi was developing the government Uh, had a very very positive role in offering and inviting the industry with all this uh, uh, low electricity rate low water supply very low uh, land at very low level low price and all these things to make it a industrial city uh, and a service city so that ultimately did delhi change its character now you see like a development like rohini rohini when it was developed known as papankala at that time it was the outskirts of delhi and 90% of the development were meant for the ews and now you see um, sorry dwarka not rohini it's dwarka now you see the dwarka you won't find uh, very uh, that uh, that character of uh, dwarka which has uh, many history because the ews people many of them have changed the uh, ownership and we know the filtering down process which changed to uh, this uh, so delhi uh, started developing in a uh, with uh, all the government initiative and the public uh, public hand uh, the dds uh, involvement was very much and at that time the private sector involvement was not thought of so now we are having a contradiction 
that how much to uh, regulate and how much to give for the initiative to the privatization how to unleash the energy of private individual that is on one side and how much to regulate and this keeps on and in the uh, the master plan uh, now that uh, we know that migration is a strong point in delhi is a strong factor in delhi whatever we may name, we have just submitted a economic and employment projection study to the to dda for master plan 2041 there we have seen that migration is not going to calm down we may calculate on the rate of migration Uh, we make uh, we make uh, see the diversification of delhi the industrialization development of gurgaon and all this thing what has happened is that that gurgaon um, noida and all now they are attracting migration from their inner uh, rural area and so they are not they will not be able to take the migrants from delhi rather they have their own inner migration which are going to come as the city is developing i'm very rightly that is the uh, to some extent that is the problem of the smart cities also the more and more investment does a city attract more and more migration comes from all section of people now one of the pa panelists say uh, i mean like uh, she was asking that whether we are over planning what i think is that we are uh, actually we are not over planning where there is a deficiency of planning we are under under planning to certain extent why because when we are talking of the social resilience the social sustainability that every planning has to be linked with the sustainability the social sustainability not with economic sustainability and physical sustainability so the planners they generally uh, focus on the physical uh, factors and in social sustainability the social resilience there are non physical factors also which we fail to integrate like when we are uh, talking about social sustainability one important there are five points generally to the social sustainability like one is social interaction how are you planning the residential development which encourages social interaction sometime it is said that the mixed land use uh, encourages social interaction uh, rather than pure residential development in certain areas because you meet all you meet all kinds of people and there is a scope for increasing social interaction so have we linked our physical development to encourage more and more social interaction and this is the problem in many of the cities that we have a seg uh, segregated area and that's why we see delhi most um, prominently we have the uh, segregated area the rich area middle income area and all and the social interaction the scope of social interaction in certain areas are almost nil well, then what about the participation the participation of the residents if we see the participation of the uh, residents uh, how do we connect that to the physical uh, physical um, components how do we furnish that the sorry the physical components to the participation how do uh, citizens participate we have some community hall we have but is that the sufficient is there sufficient scope for normal interaction and participation with the recreation with the local recreation and is there sufficient uh, infrastructure like the local infrastructure which we need on the day to day basis so these are the area which actually these are the factors which in which increases social uh, sustainability to to active social participation we are thinking of the community stability now stability means that are the residents to fluctuate uh, too much of the rented accommodation or the people are there for uh, for long term stay these are the thing and the when people are there for the long term stay we need a different kind of infrastructure has the physical planning been uh, integrated to this kind of has the planning being aware of this kind of social need now this is the these are the area which we lack and obviously the safety comes you cannot be a, you cannot take participation participate in the uh, socially when you are not sure of safety 
and we know that uh, what is the public safety uh, condition in delhi so the master plan um, now to some extent i will give credit to the master plan that they are thinking of the weekly market and the uh, associated sanitation process of the weekly market in the uh, 2041 master plan it is uh, it was there in 2021 master plan also uh, 41 master plan has improved a lot uh, about the uh, relying on the procedure based planning to take the local planning input into it into consideration while uh, uh, while uh, thinking of the while uh, the uh, making the strategy for the local development to connect it to the um, regional development and the city development but these are all uh, not adequate to take the social uh, resistance uh, the social resilience the social sustainability how do we improve social sustainability just construction of public place and uh, reserving land for public place construction of some entertainment center are it sufficient and what kind of entertainment center for whom we are building now as the professor roy mentioned in all the cities that we see we see of the different kind of social form uh, the physical form and the privatization of course the whenever there is privatization the increasing land value has to be considered in the market uh, has to attract market and increasing land value has to be uh, compensated with the private developer well they uh, take the profit of the increasing land value in the market uh, situation and how are we going to create space for the low income group people and how are we going to uh, make the city slum free as well dda 51% of dda's land are under the slum uh, are occupied by the slum and the dda uh, encroachment which they cannot do how they are going to do the in situ development on can they do the in situ development with the kind of social mixing that is required for the social sustainability so what we feel is that that the in terms of physical the component we are thinking a lot we are doing a lot but there is hardly any attempt to integrate with the social process to make it a socially vibrant city the economic development we cannot uh, restrict it has to go delhi actually is an autopilot what we have seen is that in 2030 whatever is the present uh, it, uh, gdp of delhi it will be at least three times more in 2030 and four times more in 2040 it it will be whatever we are doing it is and that huge economy huge economic uh, factor is going to attract migrants and the so now the 2041 master plan is thinking of the public rental housing that is a very important step we need more and more public rental housing and but one has to see whether where the land is uh, where they will uh, take the public rental housing in order to uh, create uh, in order to uh, that uh, facilitate the development of delhi to make it a inclusive city so professor roy is uh, all the uh, the observations are i mean i find it very uh, attractive to see that we have to see related to the governance we have to see related to the finance and we have to see the way out in terms of social integration which is lacking in our physical planning thinking thank you very much thanks a lot professor matra that that was very enriching very interesting points i think you raised uh, many fundamental questions which uh, are have still not been properly answered or attended to by the concerned stakeholders and also oh, thanks a lot for reminding everybody here about the significance of participatory planning and participatory approach uh, i'm sure uh, uh, professor roy has uh, uh, has uh, come across such uh, Uh, such aspects uh, in his work from time to time and uh, there could be one or more one or a few more of the points that you raised uh, would be of certainly interest and uh, use to professor roy now uh, before we thanks so thank you uh, dr metra 
once again. Uh, I I think Arjun, we have uh, we can take one or two questions. I think Professor uh, Mahalaya Chatterjee has has uh, expressed interest in uh, giving uh, some comments on the presentation, or she may like to say something since she is present in this discussion. May I invite Professor Mahalaya? Yes, Mahalaya, ma'am, over to you. Please unmute. Mahalaya, yes, over Thank to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Arjun, and thank you, uh, thanks to Rumi for uh, giving me this chance. Uh, again, just like Tatagato said, that I have collaborated with Professor Roy in so many occasions that uh, we generally share same type of vision and other things. I would like to just point out to two things. Firstly, that if you think uh, uh, that uh, cities are the engines of growth in India, uh, to quote from my friend Partho Bhukopadhyay, that they are without drivers from the very beginning. And today also, this is also happening in the same uh, fashion, that whenever we face a crisis, we try to deal with it. We are talking about ownership housing uh, under different types of housing scheme. And when we, in the pandemic situation, we found this uh, migrant situation and others, the homeless people going back and other things, we are now uh, we are talking about affordable housing, affordable rental housing. Uh, quote and unquote rental. We forgot about the rental thing with uh, rent control and other things in fashion. We forgot that and just now we have brought this affordable rental housing. So this brings us to the very important question uh, which Professor Rai has raised but not elaborated. But as an economist, I would like to do that, that the issue of urban land. Uh, the, the urban land is restricted, urban land is limited and uh, that takes us to everything you, uh, to talk about either greenfield uh, exp expansion of cities or brownfield reconstruction, renewal, whatever way you are speaking. It, it's, it's concerned about the issue of land. And when there is private land ownership, that makes things very, very, very difficult to go for together that to extract the economic value of land and to make the uh, social things uh, uh, social thing to accommodate the social issues to make cities inclusive uh, with the price of land uh, that is going to that is market being in the work that is going to push away the people who cannot afford that land hmm. in uh, Kolkata when we talk about Kolkata development and anything uh, you know that with the Kolkata when the land is protected by the slum land is protected by the Tika Tenancy Act the slum will rebel there. Uh, if you change the basic premises of uh, Tika Tenancy Act, the slum will be removed. Uh, uh, and this takes us to the failure of one of the projects, that is the Rajiv Awas Yojana. I cannot talk of other cities, but I have the examples of two or three cases uh, in the, uh, the extended suburb of Kolkata, Kolkata one in Chunarpur, uh, that is the, in the south eastern part of Kolkata and two or three in the northern extension of Kolkata, where we found that in Raj, Rajiv Abbas Yojana, uh, in terms of slum improvement and other things, one of the basic precondition was the clear title of the land and the so-called consent of the landowner. Uh, this, in fact, boomerang, that is the landowner took this chance. He never gave consent when the slum was on private land. He never gave gave his consent for improving the slum rather than he uh, he walked uh, he took the advantage of the law existing law and uh, there was much displacement and apartments came up in case of slums the slum dwellers were removed from that area so, so uh, if we don't uh, address the question of land uh, all these things that is uh, all these all the points Professor Ra has talking about will be futile uh, everywhere because the land price, given the constricted supply of land in urban areas, its price is going to rise and that will create this type of inequality, this pushing away, this uh, non-inclusive uh, city development and everything. Now, thank you. Thanks for giving me this chance. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Mahalaya. That was uh, wonderful to hear your views on this subject. Uh, there, there are many learnings uh, from, from the opinions that you have shared with us. Uh, I would like to take this discussion forward uh, by 
before I invite uh, Professor Roy to give his uh, closing remarks or closing statements, I, I just wanted to ask if any of the discussions, uh, the four discussions uh, that we have today, uh, would any of the discussions like to uh, give give a, give their word about the way forward or uh, any suggestion that comes to mind before I turn to Professor Roy? Dr. Sood, you, would you like to wish, uh, would you wish to say, uh, add to the comments that you made in the previous part of the discussion? Um, well, not quite add, but I would like to uh, perhaps, you know, uh, elaborate on, uh, uh, you know, some, some of the discussion that, you know, I think is coming up. I think, uh, you know, and I'm very glad that, uh, you know, Professor Maitra, you know, uh, and, you know, other panelists, uh, 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 Mr. Panwar also brought out the issue uh, of uh, financial resilience, right? Financial sustainability. And I think uh, that's something that we tend to overlook, uh, you know, in these discussions. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the kinds of solutions that are sometimes floated, for example, municipal debt, right? Uh, we know that they can have long term, fairly negative effects on uh, urban resilience. So that's just something that I wanted to add, uh, but uh, thank you very much. I think this has been very stimulating for me to hear from, you know, Professor Maitra, of course, and, you know, Professor Mahira Chatterjee, I not had a chance to interact before, so I'm really glad to hear from you. Thank you, Dr. Sood. Uh, that was, uh, uh, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, Professor Chatterjee, would you like to uh, say anything towards the end? Uh... Uh, a very small issue, uh, I think, uh, you know, I mean, just following up from what uh, Dr. Ashima issued has also mentioned, uh, that about uh, uh, evil bees are in debt. And now, you know, I mean, there are uh, increasing pressures on evil bees to uh, um, improve their financial conditions and land monetization happens to be one of the key instruments for uh, raising the ULB uh, finances. And there are uh, instruments like premium FSI uh, are being talked about and uh, are also getting implemented uh, in some of the uh, cities. Uh, so that brings up the question uh, is that unless there is a strong planning framework um, and, uh, and also the question of, you know, I mean, how do you monetize land um, uh, without having a strong planning framework? I mean, this can lead to, um, uh, this can lead to uh, unbridled uh, commercialization of the city and the role of the city government would also turn into more of a promoter, uh, a promoting agency uh, rather than a, uh, a public uh, uh, interest. So, so that is an uh, issue that requires uh, greater debate uh, in the uh, years to come. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, Mr. Panwar, if you are there, would you like to say uh, some concluding thoughts you may like to share? I think uh, he, he must have left. Uh, Dr. Metra, are you, if you are there? Please unmute. Yeah. Uh, a very small uh, addition to the uh, role of the local bodies. I was just reading Mohala's uh, comments that the South City are getting the maximum revenue from the uh, for Calcutta Municipal Corporation. They are generating maximum revenue. What happens in Delhi is that that is that the ro role of local uh, local bodies are very much to be integrated to the master plan for uh, for the local implementation and the revenue generation and all this. What happened in Delhi, Delhi has become richer and richer with the poorer and poorer 
condition of the municipal finance uh, financial issues. That is from uh, I was part of this uh, fourth municipal valuation committee. Uh, the for the after the first municipal valuation committee, the property value has not been raised. Uh, even the property uh, classification that the plus, uh, first municipal comi uh, valuation committee suggested uh, that from A to H, depending on the infrastructure, depending on the other facilities that the locality has, the A to H. After that, so many years have, uh, have come, metro is there, so many infrastructural development have been there. Till now, the property, uh, not even valuation tax rate, even the gradation of the locality has remained the same. The gradation which was in B, C, D, now all are qualified to become in the A category, but that also has not been done. So uh, I don't know that how the development of the city is going to uh, be uh, going to help the municipal corporations uh, with the uh, property tax system um, um, system that we have. And the, always the municipal commissioner is presenting a deficit budget. And whenever he is in a, all the municipal uh, corporations in Delhi, whenever he is asking for an increase in revenue, the, it is denied by the mayor and the councillor. So this is a perpetual uh, problem that we have. And along with that, we have the NDMC, which is the declared as the smart city. And NDMC has the highest uh, per capita revenue in terms of the municipal revenue generation. And all NDMC's uh, expenditure are borne by the central government. NDMC doesn't have a deficit. It has got how, um, the highest per capita income, and it has got all the facilities, and it is going, even then, it has its slumped. It has uh, 36 uh, slums within its area, which is going to now uh, institute development and all these things becoming. So it is going to be another example of inequality within the city where all these barriers, we just don't know how to cross. These are uh, the, the city that is getting development, but the municipal corporation, uh, the situation of them is the remaining the same. So we, don't, we just don't know. I have no answer that how we are going to uh, cross the barrier. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to now turn to Professor Roy for his final uh, points that he wishes to put forward uh, as we come towards the end of this uh, discussion by, by Impri. Uh, Professor Roy, I'm sure uh, the experience yeah. shared by the discussants has been uh, very rich. Uh, they, they bring different experiences through their work. And uh, uh, in, in the work that you are engaged in, some of these ideas would certainly be of use and uh, you might be interested in exploring these further or documenting some of the uh, thoughts that have been presented by the discussants. Over to you, Professor Roy. Yeah, uh, thanks to all the panelists for their very valuable comments, uh, Professor Boy and Sitra Maitro. Uh, Actually, uh, I was a student of Professor Ashish Moitra in uh, School of Planning yes, and Architecture. I know that. I know that. <laughs> and he was my supervisor also. So, convey my we, regards to uh, Sir. We uh, should have called him then. Shitra, you should have told me. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 I thought that this would be a good He's, opportunity uh, to meet Madam. Downstairs, uh, actually. Yeah. So that's my, my good opportunity to meet her here yeah, and uh, convey, sir, uh, Madam, please convey my regards to sir. Yes, and, uh, sure. He was uh, also remembering you. Yeah. <laughs> so in fact, just uh, probably a few weeks back, I, I talked uh, with him over phone just to take, uh, uh, to, inform, uh, to get uh, uh, information about his health. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so very valuable observations and from Maitro for social sustainability dimensions, you have rightly mentioned which probably all of us miss uh, the community stability and the security and all these issues, which are very important parameters, the metrics or indicators. And similarly, the, uh, all the comments of uh, Tathagat, uh, we, we discuss a lot about this when we, we share our thoughts uh, in our internal discussions or papers. And also uh, Professor Mahala's point about land is very, very uh, relevant because land is, is the, the, the crux of the matter and uh, from Sir Ashima Shud's uh, observation that uh, whether we are doing over planning, probably this uh, this planning issue, what to me, what is uh, in this uh, social sustainability because uh, now we are 
uh, 20 years in this uh, globalization area now and uh, uh, there was really a uh, uh, lot of expectation from this unlocking of land uh, which was there when when the JNURM reforms uh, have been suggested and there was also some uh, conditions are tied that uh, the fund will not be available unless these mandatory reforms are uh, complied and all. So now I think uh, one one important issue is what is the now uh, what has happened after this relaxation or the repeal of these uh, rent control acts or ultra. So this is one one point. My my uh, suggestion is the the city authority and the mini government of India should also look into, particularly where. Uh, land is of a premium value. So uh, whether this has uh, led to further uh, destabilization or uh, uh, displacement of communities, uh, there, are, there are reports on that, but we need to create a very strong database. The evidence is very important. We actually, we do a lot of debate without evidence, and uh, but we need to create a strong database that what has happened and who has got hold of the land so that is very important. Second is when we talk about this uh, uh, inner city redevelopment, actually the issues are different in larger cities. What uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee has mentioned that for mega cities where the, the uh, land is scarce and uh, the land value is equal to uh, global north cities. So probably we have to really go for a more of a uh, optimum solution. Uh, we, we cannot have a uh, Shanghai in Mumbai, the kind of world class standards we are pitching in or, or we are uh, advocating. So probably that is uh, because the, the, uh, they're following either global north models or Singapore models or Dubai models, but the entire uh, situation is different there, the land uh, tenure. Uh, we have hardly have a strong database about the land tenure. So uh, in, in absence of that, uh, uh, when we are imposing or implanting a model like this, uh, so our model probably would be would, would develop from our ground reality and there all this land, for example, uh, still uh, we are so, uh, uh, so much uh, familiar with, with the ownership concept, but uh, there are discussions going on. I'm not saying those are, uh, those are all ideally possible, but we can check that uh, the community land trust and other opportunities. So, so there was some discussion a few days back uh, by Professor Shirish Patel, Mr. Shirish Patel. He was telling that the land for affordable housing, like we, we take out the land for other amenities from the market. I'm, I'm not advocating this at this moment, but uh, probably at least for the poorest of the poor, whether land can be in the market. Uh, I also have that question. So can this 20% or 30% of the, the land which is owned by very high density slums. Now, what is that? That is put to the market and we have gone for land sharing or the SRA schemes and all. Whether SRA scheme is the answer? Probably not. In more, so it has a relation with density. So we have to really look into the, what is the density? Whether it is we are further densifying the situation, then probably that's not the answer. So that is why we have to, uh, we have, to have checks and balances. We have to relate with density mobility accessibility of these group of people otherwise this the the, the puzzle cannot be uh, first we have to understand the puzzle the relation between density uh, size of land and the land uh, the, the distance or accessibility to their work centers if we have a strong uh, indicate uh, relationship understanding of relationship between these three and then we have certain idea as uh, this thresholds of density beyond which we cannot have a, a, a kind of a public health, which we, we saw that many SRS schemes have uh, people with uh, various kinds of uh, uh, health hazards. So probably we, we have to really uh, uh, unpack the relationship between density, land value, and land size, plot ownership. And that is very much important for the, uh, for the bigger cities or mega cities that we have to do. Second is we have to come out from the formal, informal, kind of binary and we have to accept that yes slum is is one kind of uh, typology and we cannot just revert that typology in one fine morning to a vertical slum then we are actually uh, putting them in a much more vulnerable situation so we have to go beyond physical renewal that is very important so in europe 
they talked about though they could not achieve all the time but the focus was on apart from physical there was social and economic uh, uh, approaches so here it is equally important that we need to take a more of a more uh, comprehensive approach to renewal uh, future redevelopment whether it is uh, related to the social and economic upliftment or at least sustaining that uh, community or not whether the breaking up of the community is happening so that is for the larger uh, cities where this is a major problem so that uh, i i i still i should stop here because we have already crossed two hours so i think that is my observation and obviously the the approaches would be quite different and more flexible in case of uh, the second tier or the uh, the uh, uh, not that uh, big cities compared to mumbai calcutta delhi or other places where land is uh, really in a contested uh, item yeah so the i like paint Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Roy. About it, it is wonderful to know you and to learn about the good work that you were engaged in. Uh, I'm sure all of us learned many things from the work that you presented today, uh, and uh, your your work adds to uh, the requirements of the existing work that is going on. A lot of further work is needed in this area too. address the issue uh, i uh, i would like to conclude uh, uh, firstly i would like to thank you on behalf of impri and uh, would like to share my concluding thoughts before i uh, hand over the, uh, the 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 platform to to dr arjun kumar and i wish to say that uh, uh, the the realization about an inclusive approach uh, has and its practice has been there for long uh, if you look at any of the documents uh, uh, produced by these government departments either at the national state or local level uh, they and and this is this has grown over time this this has grown over time about the emphasis and since uh, india uh, has to partner with the global world community on many aspects uh, and there are guidelines within which now countries are uh, are working together therefore uh, you cannot do away with this uh, neglecting the inclusive uh, approach and you have to factor in this when you are either preparing a plan or developing a scheme uh, and there there is evidence i would say that uh, uh the amount of work that is needed to be done and you rightly point out pointed out and so have the other panelists today the amount of work that is needed to be done is not being done uh by those who are uh, looking into these affairs um they, they they you you cannot say that nothing has been done there there, there is evidence uh there are examples even in current times whether you talk about the smart cities mission about the one project in agra about the development of four micro skill centers i write a lot about smart cities so i was looking at the list of projects uh, that have been proposed and that have been implemented in some of the selected cities so i learned about the development of four micro skill uh, centers in in Tajganj area of Agra, which has been selected under the mission, uh, they they train uh, uh, people from the economically weaker sections, especially the women, about about uh, embroidery and and basically imparting skills so that they are able to start some economic activity. So so that that that's uh, that's one example. Uh, there then there could be many other examples that are going on. Uh, I, I saw I learned from the news about. the work that has been undertaken in shahjanabad area of delhi old delhi where a a corridor or a major road has been uh, completely made free of traffic no motor vehicles to ply on that road uh, because it adds to a lot of chaos and congestion and pollution and lots of problems for the local communities there uh, the, so and i see uh, if 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 you think about a city or if you uh, we all know about indian cities and the conditions or the characteristics that they display about 
various kinds of arrangements that that are visible in uh, in for example in, in i am more familiar with delhi uh, so in in delhi you know within these uh, planned colonies there are pockets of informal areas they they have been there for a long time now i see that the government in many cases has not uh, relocated or evicted this population from those areas but i see a governance and management deficit that needs to be attended to so uh, while they have not been relocated as has happened in the case of sabarmati riverfront project that you mentioned about there too i feel that uh, you know the entire work could have been handled in a much better manner uh, we see along drains and along river courses they are inhabitable areas they are not good for the population to live in there are many kinds of health related issues so the best option for them is to is to relocate that population to better areas uh, unfortunately while relocation did happen in sabarmati uh, from sabarmati riverfront area i have been to those areas to see the kind of houses that have been constructed for those communities uh, so i would say that uh, incomplete work has been done you know the construction was substandard the quality of materials used the the facilities that were provided their connectivity with the with the main areas of the city where they were entirely dependent upon uh, for living uh, for sale of flowers or for sale of other commodities or the work informal activities that they might have been engaged in you know this entire process of relocation has not been handled in the best possible manner so my observation there is that uh, if such a relocation is required in the interest of the population then it, it has to be done properly you when uh, jagmohan ji the former governor of uh, jammu and kashmir and and he has played an important role in relocation of many slums from from central areas of delhi to the like from the yamuna pushta area of delhi to to peripheral areas he did mention while we were discussing about the economic opportunities that were created for the relocated population like the the mandis and the wholesale markets and the informal activities in which they could be engaged so that uh, movement is minimal and they have something in hand to make a living so uh, my uh, thought on the topic that you presented today is that uh, that uh, and as we all know that uh, things are happening in bits and pieces very little is happening very little is being thought of i don't know what uh, uh, engagements are more important to the government than to look after the the the, the masses when when the discussion happens on who has a right to the city everyone has a right to the city uh, you cannot uh, stop communities you cannot they, they too have a right to make a living they they too have a right to survive so so in this context i would say that uh, proper conditions have to be created for for those communities when you are attending to the requirements of the rich and the middle income categories uh, at least 40 to 50% attention to begin with should be given to those who are uh, facing difficulty in leading a good quality of life uh, so thank you once again on behalf of the organizers uh, i would uh, be uh, this was my first exposure to your work i would say uh, and it was great uh, uh, meeting you online and learning about the the work i would be looking forward to reading your publications and building my understanding of of the work that you've been doing over the years uh, and uh, a lot of such uh, work is required by the policy makers uh, who might be looking for new ideas rich ideas that are doable that are manageable for them to do uh, they might not have the time to look into the details the research uh, that uh, academic and research communities engaged in so so uh, some crisp thoughts emerging from such discussions uh, would certainly be welcome uh, to to those who are in the policy making circles uh, over to you dr arjun kumar thank you very much thank, thank you. you dr gumi thank you thank you very much uh, 
uh, all of our very senior professors also. And as uh, Rumi sir also highlighted that so much to learn from this uh, work of what Professor Roy has highlighted today. Sir really also uh, suggested us alternate topics also, but we really chose this uh, so that uh, how sir is invoking our uh, thought processes about uh, urbanism and uh, uh, w what has been also uh, sir is alluding to so many of points also from the international point of view and we are so fortunate to have all i would say our nation's best urban uh, experts and researchers here also adding to our deliberation so thank you very much all of you so now let me formally uh, propose a vote of thanks on behalf of uh, IMPRI, Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies. Thank you everyone for joining this IMPRI hashtag web policy talk and today's deliberation of four hour series, the state of cities, hashtag city conversation on the topic, social dimensions of resilience, challenges of inner city redevelopment and impact and way forward by Professor Sovnik Roy. Thank you so much, sir, for putting this all together and getting our attention here. Uh, it was really very uh, interesting and as a young researcher many are also commenting here and on Facebook live that really very insightful uh, thank you so much sir I'm also very thankful to our chair uh, uh, Rumi Azar sir for being here uh, despite so late also and being so uh, uh, supportful about all these ideas and leading this together we look so much forward uh, for this uh, in Kolkata event also we had a good gathering Rumi sir if you can remember uh, we yeah. miss Dominic sir, but many other people also joined. Thank you very much. And uh, we are also thankful to all our eminent discussants, Professor Tathagata sir, uh, Tikender sir, Dr. Ashima ma'am, Shepra ma'am, and also uh, Professor Mahalia ma'am for joining and all of our participants here on Zoom and those who are watching on Facebook Live and later watch on YouTube and our other podcast. Thank you for joining this very interesting and stimulating discussion today. And uh, we wish that you will uh, join uh, in future to our future episodes of City Conversations and we can learn in, in together in the future. Thank you everyone and we wish you a very good night and please take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Prasada. Thank you. Thank you.